Radioactive nuclear waste. The end product of all nuclear reactors and manufacturing sites and every step of the nuclear fuel chain is the gift that keeps on giving, whether we want it or not. The nuclear industry loves to put out propaganda talking points to make it seem like they're really focused on proper storage of radioactive waste with a half-life of 24,000 years, and they point to Yucca Mountain in Nevada as its ultimate national resting place. That makes it easy for the general public to look where they're pointing and think, Yeah! Yucca! That's the ticket! We're saved! Huzzah! But then... You talk to a genuine expert, like Mary Olson, who is a retiring veteran member of the Nuclear Information and Resource Service staff and acting director of Gender and Radiation Impact Project, and she tells you that the problem with citing Yucca Mountain as a permanent waste repository is that it is... The thing, the program, the place is a package deal that allows officials to say that there is a permanent solution for waste even though there is no repository there and it will leak if the waste is ever put there and could even have a volcanic eruption through the site. There's evidence that that could happen and DOE analyzed it in their EIS. So it's not a really controversial issue that it's a bad site. But no matter what, even if it's a terrible site, having it allows the policy people and the industry to claim that consolidated interim storage is interim because they can point at Yucca and say that's the permanent solution. So this thing we're doing here is going to be temporary. Well, Yucca may never happen. If that's the case, and the government and the nuclear industry continue in a full court press to force high-level nuclear waste on New Mexico and or West Texas for a so-called interim that will ultimately prove to be forever, you suddenly realize that Yucca Mountain is just a convenient fiction to mask the fact that we are all sitting in the exact same dangerous radioactive seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat, it's the bomb. Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, a special report on a recent national gathering of nuclear activists working on radioactive waste issues. The event happened in New Mexico, a state that's pretty much ground zero for the worst of our nuclear issues. You will hear from more than 20 on-the-ground activists attempting to wrestle the nuclear beast into some kind of sanity, both nationally as well as in their own backyards. We will also have numbnuts of the week for outstanding nuclear boneheadedness and more honest nuclear information than was announced by the U.S. House of Representatives this week. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, December 10, 2019, and here is this week's Nuclear Hot Seat special on the radioactive nuclear waste conference that took place in Albuquerque in November. All of it coming to you from a different perspective. Before we go there, however, considering we were in New Mexico... And focusing on nuclear waste issues, it's only fitting that we start with a relevant story from that most popular of all nuclear hot seat features. Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that's out of week. The contractor that's been in charge of the Los Alamos National Laboratory's operations for the past year lost track of 250 barrels of radioactive waste, while the company heading the legacy cleanup mislabeled and improperly stored waste containers and took 
months to remedy some infractions. This according to New Mexico's yearly report on hazardous waste permit violation. Triad National Security LLC, Limited Liability Corporation, remember that, a consortium of nonprofits that runs the lab's daily operations, had 19 violations of its permit from the New Mexico Environment Department. While Newport News Nuclear BWX Telos Alamos, which is managing a 10 year cleanup of waste generated at the lab, was cited 29 times. Among the problems, Barrels filled with rad waste were covered in rain or snow because they were stored under fabric domes that have holes in them because of inclement weather. This according to Steve Horak, spokesman for the Energy Department's Environment Management Field Office in Los Alamos. According to Jay Coglin, Executive Director of Nuclear Watch New Mexico, the fact that Lanel, Los Alamos, has mischaracterized, misplaced, misinventoried, or whatever, 250 barrels of waste is pretty astounding. We see mistakes being made by a new contractor, so definitely all of this is cause for concern. Ya think? And that's why. Triad National Security, LLC, and Newport News Nuclear BWXT, whatever that means, Los Alamos, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of the week. Given that preview of just one of the problems the nuclear industry has in dealing with nuclear waste, let's get to the larger issues. Highly radioactive nuclear waste from reactors, as well as manufacturing, refining, uranium mining, and transport. Every activist group in the country must deal with these issues in some form. This year, people from around the country came together in Albuquerque, New Mexico, for a five-day conference, sharing experiences, strategies, what has worked, and what has not. The time together included tours of local radioactive hotspots, a trip to the area around Los Alamos National Laboratory, networking, even a talent show, so we could take a break from all of the seriousness presented at the many panel discussions. We shared what worked locally, what didn't, where we need support, talking points, everything we could to consolidate efforts nationally. What follows is an audio montage of just a few of the more than 100 attendees, all of whom had important information to share. We'll start with Dave Kraft, of Nuclear Energy Information Service, or NEIS, which is headquartered in Chicago and was one of the sponsoring organizations for the conference. He gave an overview of the five days and why what we were doing is so important. This is Dave Kraft, Director of Nuclear Energy Information Service in Chicago. So we're at a a summit dealing with high-level radioactive waste, which is essentially the spent fuel rods that come out of the reactors when they're no longer useful to produce electricity. And this is a critical time nationally, and in certain cases regionally, for a variety of reasons. You have nuclear utilities claiming that their reactors are not profitable, and so they're threatening closure, which means that all of the radioactive waste ever produced suddenly has nowhere to go when the reactors shut down. You have bailouts that are tied to that to keep the reactors open, which means they're going to produce more of the waste if they do stay open. Beyond that, you have to figure out what to do with the plant itself and decommissioning the plant, tearing it down. And once that happens, again, the high-level radioactive waste is stuck. It has no place to go because we don't have a national repository for disposal. It's also critical in terms of national legislation. The conservative administrations we've had over the last number of decades are resurrecting the Yucca Mountain Project. They're providing funding for it to look into opening the site, even though we know it is geologically inadequate. And as another stopgap, there are private entities that are trying to get special licenses from the nuclear regulators at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to open what they called temporary sites in West Texas and southeast New Mexico. What we have found with the federal government is temporary usually means forever because nobody really wants to deal with it once it's out of their backyard. So it's a very critical time in terms of figuring out what is a better way of handling high-level radioactive waste. And in large part, that's what the summit we're doing here in New Mexico is all about. Dave Kraft of NEIS.com. 
org. Kevin Camps has been a nuclear waste specialist for Beyond Nuclear and Beyond Nuclear International for several decades. He's one of our top experts. Note that when Kevin references the work of Arjun Makajani, he's talking about the electrical and nuclear engineer who is president of the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research, someone who has testified before Congress and has served as an expert witness in Nuclear Regulatory Commission proceedings. Hi, my name is Kevin Camps. I serve as radioactive waste specialist at Beyond Nuclear in Tacoma Park, Maryland. And I was going to talk a little bit about hardened on-site storage, which is referred to as HOSS, H-O-S-S. This idea was born in April of 2002 at an event organized by Citizens Awareness Network of the Northeast in Connecticut. An event was held on the very eve of the big Yucca Mountain votes in Congress, this attempt, this scheme to dump the nation's high-level radioactive waste on western Shoshone Indian land. And as pushback against that, and also there was a consolidated interim storage facility targeted at the Skull Valley Go Shoots in Utah at the time. A lot of people got together from all over the country in the anti-nuclear movement, and Dr. Arjun Makajani gave the keynote presentation. And essentially it was entitled Hardened On-Site Storage. And the idea is there are better things we can do than dump it on Indian land out west. Some of the specifics would include get it out of the pools because the pools are mega catastrophes waiting to happen. And yes, put it into a dry cask storage configuration, but not the dry casks that we've been suffering for decades in this country which take shortcuts at every opportunity on safety and security and cost and all that to do much better dry casks and include things like radiation monitoring, heat monitoring, pressure monitoring in real time, fortify the dry casks against attack, safeguard them against accidents, and prepare for the day when you're going to have to replace the dry casks when they corrode and begin to leak their contents. So that was hardened on-site storage in the early days. Then um, Citizens Awareness Network hired Dr. Gordon Thompson of Cambridge, Massachusetts to do a a full-length technical report that he entitled Robust Storage, and it put some more skin on the bones of the idea. And we have been pushing this idea ever since at every opportunity, name the Nuclear Regulatory Commission proceeding. So, for example, uh, Nuclear Waste Confidence Continued Storage thousands, tens of thousands of comments, many of which mentioned hardened on-site storage as needed. The Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Nuclear Future, again, thousands or tens of thousands of comments calling for hardened on-site storage. The powers that be in the federal government have ignored these calls, unfortunately, so we still live with the dangers of pool storage. We still live with the dangers of inadequate dry cast storage. We live with these threats of dumping on the western Shoshone at Yucca or dumping on the Hispanic communities of the Texas-New Mexico borderlands, very close to uh, the Mescalero Apache Reservation that was previously targeted for consolidated interim storage. And the thing thing I'll end on here is that hardened on-site storage has to happen regardless of anything else. So if a dump were to open today where the waste could be sent to, it's going to take 25 to 50 years to move all the waste there. That's up to 50 more years of on-site storage risks. So if you're not doing hardened on-site storage, you're taking 50 years of risk somewhere that this radioactive waste is going to explode into the environment either fast, like in a terrorist attack or a natural disaster, or slowly through corrosion and leakage. And in a situation like San Onofre, where they're using five-eighths inch thin canisters and just lowering them into a a, a concrete bunker, how does that measure up in terms of hardened on-site storage? It's the exact opposite. And we've suffered very similar treatment at Palisades in Michigan, where I'm from, how I got involved in these issues 25, 30 years ago. Dry cast storage on the beach of Lake Michigan in very poorly made thin wall dry casks. They're called ventilated storage containers, VSC-24s. They hold 24 irradiated pressurized water reactor fuel assemblies. Uh, Lake Michigan and downstream, that's the drinking water supply for 40 million people in multiple states, multiple Canadian provinces, and a very large number of Native American First Nations. Those are the risks being taken in southwest Michigan with uh, really dangerously badly designed and manufactured dry casks plopped on the beach of Lake Michigan. And now the folks around San Onofre are facing a very similar situation. 
So this is the opposite. But the thing that we would like to point out about hardened on-site storage is there are some places, like Palisades, Michigan, like San Onofre, California, where on-site may not be acceptable. You just can't make it safe on-site. It's too dangerous a site. And in that case, uh, as near as possible to the site. And so in the case of San Onofre, the Camp Pendleton Marine Corps base is right across the highway. In fact, San Onofre is on the Marine Corps base. They've leased the land all these decades. So to move it a few miles east to higher ground, away from the earthquake fault lines, away from the tsunami zone, and with the added advantage, away from rising seas, with the added advantage of thousands of U.S. Marines to help guard it, And I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I'm not going to say that should happen in San Onofre, California, but not in Palisades, Michigan. In Palisades, we need to find a site further inland to higher ground where it can be better safeguarded and secured against the natural disasters or the, you know, human-made disasters that could happen with this stuff. And there's going to be many an example of that. Prairie Island, Minnesota is another one, an Indian reservation in the Mississippi River that suffers regular flooding. They should not have built the two reactors there. They should not have the dry cast storage there. It was proposed way back in the early 90s that the waste be taken off the island, taken further inland to higher ground to safeguard it and secure it. And unfortunately, the predominantly white Goodhue County community decided that was not going to happen. It was going to stay on the Prairie Island Indian Community Reservation in this high-risk flood zone. And what's so crazy about that is if something were to happen at Prairie Island itself, Goodhue County is not going to somehow be exempted from the consequences. In fact, they kind of laid the groundwork for such a catastrophe by demanding that the waste stay on the island and not enter their county, which is right across the river, is surrounding this site. So there are examples in the country where on-site can't happen because it's not safe, but as near as possible to the point of generation. And ultimately, you know, hardened on-site storage is an interim measure. This is not a permanent solution. Maybe it'll buy us 50 years. Maybe it'll buy us 100 years. What we need to find, unfortunately, but we do, is a geologic site that can safely isolate this waste from the environment forever. And good luck with that. It's going to be very difficult. We've never found such a site in all these decades of looking. Yucca Mountain fails every single test. Scientific suitability environmental justice, legality. What about the Treaty of Ruby Valley? Yucca Mountain's not a legal proposal. Then you've got intergenerational equity. It can't leak down the road. It just can't leak. Interregional equity. The east is where 90% of the waste is and the reactors. So why are all the targeted dump sites out west? And then how about uh, transport risk mitigation? So if you choose a far western dump site and most of the reactors are in the east, you are maximizing the transport risks. So all of these criteria need to be considered. But the reason this waste can't stay on the surface in hardened on-site storage is because any container, no matter how hardened, no matter the quality, will eventually fail over time. And with loss of institutional control, if the containers are not replaced, then the waste will simply leak into the environment. And even the Department of Energy has warned about this in their bid to sell Yucca Mountain. They said, oh, you really want to get this stuff into Yucca as soon as possible because if it stays at the surface, it will leak catastrophically someday as containers fail. And they're right. Yucca's wrong. We fought it, and hopefully we will end it for good. But... That dilemma is the dilemma. It can't stay on the surface, no matter how good your surface facility is. It's just too chaotic a place, from worsening climate chaos to warfare to terrorism to something as simple as rust and age-related degradation. You don't want this right in the biosphere. And to further the dilemma, the lithosphere deep geologic disposal is the biosphere. I think a lot of folks are open to the idea these days that The rock of the earth is also a part of the living environment and will change over time. And some of the poisons in this waste, like iodine-129, has a half-life of 15.7 million years. That's 157 million years of hazard. So you really got to choose a good geologic repository because you have poisons that are going to be deadly for 157 million years, if not 314 million years. 20 half-lives is safer to take it out that far. That's a long time. (laughs) That's geologic time. Uh, Geology changes over those kinds of time periods. So we're going to have to wrestle with this dilemma and realize there are no easy answers. 
and we need to fend off all these bad proposals. Kevin Camps of BeyondNuclear.org and BeyondNuclearInternational.org. Putting an even sharper point on the propaganda talking points of the nuclear industry is Mary Olson. She is a retiring veteran staff member of Nuclear Information and Resource Service, or NEARS.org, and now the acting director of Gender and Radiation Impact Project. Here, she focuses on what Yucca Mountain is and isn't. Yucca Mountain is a place, but it's also a program, and it's also an appropriations item. And in the nuclear world, you don't necessarily have to deliver a product or a service to be funded. And this is a $100 billion budget that if they decided to go back into it, would be a total hog trough. Feast for any nuclear contractor to say they're working on Yucca Mountain and get money. Whether they ever delivered a repository or not is the first point. But the second point is that it's also the thing, the program, the place is a package deal that allows officials to say that there is a permanent solution for waste, even though there is no repository there and it will leak if the waste is ever put there and could even have a volcanic eruption through the site. There's evidence that that could happen, and DOE analyzed it in their EIS. So it's not a really controversial issue that it's a bad site. But no matter what, even if it's a terrible site, having it allows the policy people and the industry to claim that consolidated interim storage is interim because they can point at Yucca and say that's the permanent solution. So this thing we're doing here is going to be temporary. Well, Yucca may never happen. All that money may get spent and it still never be delivered because of the corruption and greed of the nuclear industry. And that is why our current law says that one cannot move the waste to a temporary site unless and until a repository is actually open. And the current bills in Congress would gut that provision in the current law and allow DOE to give money to Holtec and to WCS and their partners to move the waste to sites that are not qualified for permanent isolation, are not intended for permanent isolation, and certainly will become de facto permanent in this picture. But they can claim that because Yucca is still on the books, that it's temporary. So what we are saying in our working group is end yucca, get rid of it, get it off the books, defund it completely, cancel it. It's officially the land of the Shoshone people, so stop pretending like it could be a nuclear dump when they said no, when Nevada said no, and when it is a complete scam. But we have to understand that the scam is functional for the story that moving the waste to New Mexico and Texas is temporary. That is why we have to keep Yucca in this conversation and say, end it. Mary Olson, currently acting director of Gender and Radiation Impact Project at genderandradiation.org. One of the points that became overwhelmingly clear at the conference is the extent to which New Mexico has been relegated by our government to the status of a nuclear sacrifice zone. They don't want it, but that's what they've got. From the Manhattan Project's work on Los Alamos National Labs and the test of the first atomic bomb, Trinity, before Hiroshima and Nagasaki, from uranium mining and the Church Rock uranium tailing spill on Navajo Nation land, the country's largest and most disastrous spill of radioactive uranium waste, which still hasn't been cleaned up, to the unrecognized and uncompensated health issues of Trinity radiation-contaminated downwinders, New Mexico has been taking it in the gut from nuclear interest since the dawn of the atomic age. And especially hard hit have been the native people in the area. Here is what some of them have to say. First, Mervyn Tilden. He is Nuclear Hot Seat Special Correspondent from Navajo Nation. What has been your involvement with the events taking place here? And what is the focus in your work as you move forward? I think it's not really a focus because it's so scattered. You got to deal with just with the uranium issues alone. You're dealing with people who come in, do the exploration, then followed by the people who will be doing the drilling, followed by the people who will be doing the ISL technicalities, all the way to the yellow cake that's produced. I think the most important thing 
that I see that's happening right now is an awakening within our tribal leadership of the grassroots activities that they're bringing forth to their attention because we're taking the time to come to meetings like this and we're taking this information to them and we're educating them we're having that kind of influence because they're not here we are but that's where i see that we're going to be having a major impact in anything that we do but it's us taking it from here to them and it's one of the things that was brought up is the absence of faith-based organizations i think we need to look a little bit closer at that because as indigenous people our life to our death is spirituality our ceremonies uh, the gatherings that we have our family structure our community structure everything is based on the spirit we say prayers before we have meetings but i think this goes into our, our like with the navajo nation council before the council opens they have someone a medicine man who comes in and says prayers but that's also reflective in the government when they make their policies their laws and effect changes and that's our role i think we need to look at as a backdrop of what goes on and how we can impact the decision makers and their policy making. Mervyn Tilden, who reports on nuclear and atomic matters for Nuclear Hot Seat from Navajo Nation. Veteran activist Patush Gilbert, whom we've spoken with for Nuclear Hot Seat specials on the International Uranium Film Festival in Window Rock and the Church Rock anniversary of the uranium tailing spill disaster, had this to say. Petrush Gilbert from Acoma here in New Mexico. I am with the Monte Corcha Alliance for a Safe Environment and a smaller core group within it called the Laguna Acoma Coalition for a Safe Environment. And we are mainly dealing and working on uranium mining and milling and the cleanup of former mines and mills and then opposing new uranium mining here in this New Mexico, and especially in our area called the Grants Mining District. Petush Gilbert. Other activists from around the state and within the Native communities weighed in on their local issues. I'm Rose Gardner, and I am uh, from Yunus, New Mexico. I'm with the Alliance for Environmental Strategies. And, of course, my concerns are that there's a high-level nuclear waste application uh, for WCS ISP, which is on the Texas side of where I, uh, near where I live, and also the Holtec International High-Level Waste application that's pending as well in New Mexico. That's about 35 minutes away from where I live. And along with Urenco, the enrichment facility that's located just outside of my town. All of these facilities are looking to target my home. They want to bring in high-level nuclear waste. Anyone can see New Mexico is doesn't have any nuclear power plants, so why do they want to dump it in our town? My concern is that I need to stop them. There's apparently a push to bring this stuff in, and we have no consent. We do not approve. And in addition to that, it could possibly affect our livelihood because I live right in the middle of the Permian Basin, which is the largest oil field in America. And we are providing a service to America. We supply with oil and gas products. And until something better comes along, I think we need to be protected because our soil could contaminate the oil field. If the contamination comes from high-level nuclear waste, how are we going to clean that up? Not only that, how can we use the oil and the gas that's extracted if it's radioactive? We've got to fight it because just putting high-level nuclear waste on a pad or in cement in the ground isn't going to cut it. They plan to keep it there for maybe 100 years. Who's going to move it? I don't think it'll move. That would make us a de facto sacrifice site, and we didn't volunteer for this. We absolutely don't want it. And in addition to that, you're affecting my grandchildren. That is the very thing that I fight for is for their health. They need to be able to look to the future with a healthy perspective, and if you have high-level waste sitting around, 
It's just not a good thing for my kids, my grandchildren, and we need to find a better solution. And of course, that would be looking for and finding a hydrologically and geologically sound place to put a repository for permanent storage. But along with that, the communities that would be involved in that need to consent. You just cannot bring something so dangerous that everyone that lives at a reactor community wants to get rid of. You can't just put it in someone where they live without their consent. We're fighting a difficult battle, and we'll continue to do what we have to do. Hi, my name is Karen Bonin, and I'm working on nuclear issues with Citizens for Alternatives to Radioactive Dumping here in Albuquerque. I've been passionate about nuclear evils since I was about 12. What is your group working on? We are working to stop CIS in New Mexico. CIS being Consolidated Interim Storage. Yes. We are also in solidarity with uranium mine workers and mill workers and all the people who have been injured. If we haven't taken a position yet, I want to, us to take a position that we're going to work for the expansion of RECA, which is the Radiation Compensation Act, which, as currently written, is about to run out of money in two years and only compensates uranium miners and other workers who worked in the industry before 1971 and only downwinders outside of New Mexico. It needs to compensate downwinders in New Mexico and uranium workers post-1970. Regarding centralized interim storage, where nuclear waste would have to be transported by rail, what if a terrorist or an insane person, or an insane terrorist were to plant a string of IEDs along the tracks, either in a populated area or on a bridge trestle over a precious water canyon. My name is Lorraine Villegas. I'm with the Alliance for Environmental Strategies from Hobbs, New Mexico. And I'm currently working on stopping Holtec. Holtec is the proposed facility I live about 35 miles from. Is there anything you want to say about Holtec? We don't need it. We're not dumping grounds, and also we're not testing grounds. Because they keep saying that there's facilities similar to it already, but there's not one exactly like this one. We have enough waste. This nuclear industry doesn't need to expand in our state. We have enough contamination and people dying of cancers that the government hasn't done anything about, yet they have money to keep putting in to try to expand So we've had enough. We don't want it. And our elected officials keep pushing for it, but the people don't want it. And if they took the time to actually talk to the people, they would see that nobody wants this. The only people that want this are the people involved in the industry, working in the industry, not us. My name is Jonathan Perry with the Eastern Napa Diné against uranium mining and the Multicultural Alliance for a Safe Environment. We focus on preventing new mining projects within the Four Corners area and the Navajo Nation. We also focus on cleanup of contaminated sites. Tribal people native to the area were in evidence in large numbers throughout the five days, which brought up the need to address issues of unintentional racism on the part of those of us in the movement who experience privilege, specifically white privilege. This is not a usual topic for discussion at a nuclear conference or most any other kind of conference, but it was found necessary for those of us attempting to build the kind of world we'd like to live in and pass on to future generations. Eileen O'Shaughnessy spoke directly to these issues and led us in a series of powerful exercises to gain greater insight and understanding. My name is Eileen O'Shaughnessy. I am the co-founder of the Nuclear Issues Study Group and a current member of the Nuclear Issues Study Group. I also teach at the University of New Mexico in the Sustainability Studies program, although I'm not speaking in that capacity right now. I gave a presentation about anti-oppression in the anti-nuclear movement and the importance of centering multiple perspectives, in particular giving voice to 
the importance for people with privilege to look critically at the ways in which they're engaging with privilege or not. And there was an article that I offered to the group by two scholars, Gorski and Ericat, which I can share with viewers or listeners if you'd like. And basically this study looked at how white activists in social movements and activists of color had different experiences of burnout. And those of us who are invested in social change know that burnout is a real issue. And in the nuclear movement, we have I think we all experience different levels of burnout. But the importance of this study is that the activists of color articulated that their burnout, by and large, 82% of them reported that it was due to basically the actions of white activists, that there were things that they were doing in terms of taking credit taking up space, reproducing racist ideas, and also engaging in what's known as white fragility. And this is something we can work on. As a white person myself, I'm really committed to making mistakes and learning from them constantly in this area. That's how having a humble attitude is is really helpful, I think. And so the thing I, I was trying to articulate to the group and that I'm personally really committed to is demonstrating that this is something that we as a movement can only benefit from going deeper into. So the more we engage with conversations that are uncomfortable around race, I'm looking at our own white privilege, how we're using that privilege, again, being willing to be to make mistakes and learn from them and especially take feedback from people of color, to center the voices of people of color, to take the lead from people of color, the more we as a movement are going to be sustainable and the more we're going to win, frankly. I mean, just to put it in a strategic framework, and, you know, I'm, I would just want to say that I'm really happy with the conversations that took place this weekend and the ways in which we, I think, as a movement, are moving in the direction of doing that work, especially centering Indigenous voices and taking the lead from Indigenous people and from people of color. Because at the end of the day, these issues fall most heavily on the bodies of people of color and indigenous people and they bear the biggest burden as do women as we know when it comes to radiation but that's an uncomfortable conversation because it's true that nuclear issues impact all of us but a social justice question asks who's most impacted so um, I'm really grateful as I said for the conversations that were had and I'm happy to share the resources that I mentioned and to speak with anyone who wants to go deeper. The goals that we have as a movement for dismantling the nuclear beast, it's just as important how we get there as it is for you know whether or not we are successful in that. And part of that involves creating the world that we want to live in now by having mutually loving relationships, accountable relationships, and incorporating the world that we want now. Eileen O'Shaughnessy. We will have a link up to the study she mentioned on the website nuclearhotseat.com under this episode number 442. We'll continue with this week's Nuclear Hot Seat special on the recent Albuquerque conference on radioactive nuclear waste. But first, well, we have survived Black Friday, Small Business Saturday, Cyber Monday, and Giving Tuesday. So now I wonder if the rest of the days of the week are named after Sneezy, Sleepy, Dopey, Gumby, or Nebuchadnezzar. Whatever, it's the holiday season. And if you're in the mood for giving, Nuclear Hot Seat needs your help. The website revamp is proceeding, the goal being easier searchability, a great new look, and the capacity to keep uploading new episodes, an issue stumping my current provider. It's an important step for the show, and one that has been a long time coming. The challenge? challenge? It's a major, major, major expense. expense. Well, well, well and above the regular operating cost for the show. the show. Now, some of you, bless you, have already provided financial support to go towards the new website, so we're able to start the process. But we've still got a long way to go to meet the full expense, and we'll need the help of a lot more of you to get this beautiful, more functional new website up and running. So if you're grateful for the information you get from Nuclear Hot Seat and want to help us get that new website up, please show your support by sending us a donation of any size. Just go to NuclearHotSeat.com and click on the big red Donate button to send us a one-time donation of any size or a continuing donation of any size. 
Know that whatever you can afford, you are helping to combat the nuclear menace in all of its many forms with solid, footnoted, reliably sourced information and soon a more searchable website. That makes me deeply grateful that you're listening and that you care. Now, back to this week's Nuclear Hot Seat Special on the recent Albuquerque Conference on Radioactive Nuclear Waste. One of the joys for me of being at this conference was the chance to meet activists and watchdogs from around the country, many of whom I've interviewed and communicated with digitally, but never met in person. Another joy was meeting new activists, many of them young, yay, with issues I'd not encountered from places I'd not yet covered, and now I'll be able to. Here's a brief introduction to some of those activists who are working on nuclear issues that impact us all. Holly Harris, Snake River Alliance. I'm the new executive director here in Idaho. And right now we are confronting the the very real possibility that the nuclear industry wants to build 12 nuclear reactors above the Snake River Aquifer. Um, This would be a first of its kind uh, nuclear power plant. They are experimenting with Idaho and hoping to then build these and ship them all over the world. These would be 12 reactors below ground, buried in water, sitting above the aquifer. And we are calling that project the Dirty Dozen. And we are hoping that we can get partners and allies across the country to recognize this is not a responsible solution to climate change. Nuclear is not green. It's dirty. It's dangerous. It's dependent upon some of the most damaging mining practices anywhere in the world, uh, most typically inflicted upon indigenous communities and communities of color. We are strongly against the suggestion that nuclear is a responsible solution to climate change. The answer to climate change is, is right before us. It's working right now in communities all over the world. It's renewable energy. It's wind, it's solar, it's storage. Uh, it's working right now all over the world, and that's our response to climate change. I'm Dr. Scott Williams. I work for the Healthy Environment Alliance of Utah, which is known as Heal Utah in Salt Lake City. And the issue we're working on related to nuclear proliferation is the proposal to build a small modular reactor complex in Idaho, which would supply power to about 30 cities and towns in Utah that have their own power systems. This is more than just a single nuclear power project because the idea is this would be a prototype of a modular nuclear reactor that could then be stamped out and put all over the world. Their idea is to make this a business, they would assembly line thousands and thousands of these and put them everywhere. So even though this seems like a little backwater project in the mountain part of the United States, it could be the beginning of a whole new proliferation of nuclear power, uranium mining, milling, enrichment, and nuclear waste. What sort of things is Heal Utah doing to push back against this? There's a number of things. So there's a process going on at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and that is to certify the um, design of the modular reactor and then also to license the facility. And actually, Sarah Fields at Uranium Watch is monitoring those calls because we're all small organizations. We have to kind of divide and conquer. And it's a very complicated process with hours and hours and hours of hearings full of technical language and trying to find out where are the decision points that we can influence. And Sarah's keeping her eye on that. In Salt Lake, we're focusing on the 30 communities that have to each vote to participate in this project. And unless they get enough of them to go in, they won't be able to go forward. They're all part of a consortium called the Utah Association of Municipal Power Systems, or UAMPS. And UAMPS is going to be the owner of this project in Idaho. And then a company called Energy Northwest in out of Washington is going to be the operator. And so there's many different entities. New Scale is the designer of the module. Floor is the builder of the project. UAMPS is the owner. Energy Northwest is the operator. So you have to sort of make sure that there's lots of different fronts that we have to pay attention to. So our main goal at HEAL is to get enough of these cities to vote against the project that they don't have enough power subscriptions to go forward. My name is John LaForge. I work with NukeWatch in Wisconsin. It's a nuclear watchdog and environmental justice group that's been around for 40 years this year. We publish the Nuclear Watch Quarterly, news and information on nuclear reactors, nuclear weapons, radioactive waste, and nonviolent resistance to militarism. For the last few years, we've been focused uh, primarily on the land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles of the United States and the need to get rid of them because they're a danger mostly to us. 
and uh, as well as um, a campaign to return to the United States U.S. nuclear weapons that are deployed in five European NATO partner countries, uh, Belgium, the Netherlands, Italy, Germany, and Turkey. Are there any specific issues in Wisconsin? Oh, there sure are, yes. Uh, a couple of years ago, the uh, owners shut down the Kiwani nuclear reactor on Lake Michigan. That's going through a decommissioning process. The irony there is that in Fukushima, Japan, where three reactors started a catastrophe in 2011 when three reactors melted down, the company there, Tokyo Electric Power Company, has said it will take 40 years to clean up that disaster that's still polluting the Pacific Ocean. Well, the people who own the Kiwani reactor said for their decommissioning, it would take 40 years. So somebody's lying about how long this is going to take. And when was Kiwani closed down? 2014. So, of course, there was no disaster at Kiwani. It was a normal shutdown based on its age and decrepitude and uh, the fact that it wasn't making enough money for the owners anymore. So a 40-year decommissioning process is supposedly the normal one. What's going on at Fukushima is a disaster of untold magnitude, which in fact contaminated all of the northern hemisphere with cesium-137 that drifted around the atmosphere. And now with three coriums, that's the technical term for the mass of melted uranium fuel that burned through the bottom of these reactors, and no way to retrieve it without harming people. That process of decommissioning and cleaning up the Fukushima disaster is going to take hundreds of years, not 40 years. Molly Johnson, San Luis Obispo Mothers for Peace. We have been interveners in the Diablo nuclear power plant since it began. And our issues are keeping the waste where it is, not sending it off to some other community to pollute. We also want to make sure that the waste is stored as safely as possible, which means nice thick cask in a building that will withstand earthquakes, tsunamis, etc. So we have our work cut out for us. Pat Townsend, I'm on the Citizens Task Force and the Environmental Coalition at West Valley in Western New York. West Valley in western New York is the only place in the country where they attempted to reprocess commercial depleted nuclear fuel. It was done in the 1960s for six years on a totally inappropriate site as a joint effort of the state of New York and the United States government. So it's both a federal and a state site. They reprocess nuclear fuel until all the legislation to protect the environment took place in the early 70s, and then they decided they couldn't meet all those regulations. So they didn't. I mean, they stopped. And the cleanup has been going on ever since, and the most serious waste has not yet been cleaned up. And it's just was never in the news at the time. It's never been in the news since. So this is a really good opportunity to start getting it in the news because we're headed for what they call the draft supplementary environmental impact statement will come out at the beginning of 2021 and it will deal with the bulk of the most serious underground waste and this is what more than 50 years later since they stopped reprocessing and it it shows both the danger of reprocessing and the slowness of cleanup steve kent I have a PR practice for nonprofits called Kent Com LLC, and I work with a lot of groups that are working on these nuclear issues. What in particular brought you to this event, and how does this align with the work that you are doing? It came out of doing work on decommissioning, which came out of doing work on watchdogging the, the plants. You know, as, as a advocate and activist watchdogging the plants, you just anticipate you, you're just hoping to get to the point where the plant's shut and you stop making more waste and you figure you can breathe a sigh of relief. But as we approach, you know, more and more plants are shutting down. My nearby plants, Indian Point, 2020 and 2021, it'll shut down. And you start doing the research, you discover that the decommissioning phase is, if anything, more dangerous than the operations phase. And it lasts forever. You've got to watchdog the waste forever, you know, as they start cutting apart the, the reactors and the equipment and shipping them or storing them. That's where the real dispersal risks are. The NRC says that 
they don't have to really regulate it to anything like the same standard as operations. It's exactly 180 degrees wrong. Decommissioning is the most dangerous and most widely distributed sort of risk because even if they do transport it, which they can't do and shouldn't do, and the roads and rails aren't equipped to handle it, neither are the casks, but they may ignore all that and do it, the transport routes go through 75% of all congressional districts. Uh, which means everybody's backyard. So doing the decommissioning work, uh, I got involved in strategic planning for the radioactive waste conferences, and here I am. I'm Wally Taylor. I'm from Marion, Iowa, and I'm working with the Sierra Club in challenging the licensing of two what they call consolidated interim storage projects to store spent nuclear fuel, uh, one site in New Mexico and one in Texas. Uh, The licensing proceeding is conducted by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and uh, for those of us attorneys who have been involved in environmental law for a number of years, dealing with the NRC process is totally different. The procedural requirements and the technical details that are required is something we've never experienced before. What's so different about it? The NRC first of all, requires you to essentially prove your case in order to even be allowed to enter into the proceeding. In ordinary uh, legal proceedings, all you have to do is make enough of an allegation to show that if your facts are correct as you alleged, you're entitled to at least uh, present your evidence and go to a proceeding, whereas uh, the NRC works diligently to keep people out of the process. Is there any way around that? Well, they could change the law, they could appoint NRC commissioners who would change the rules, but it seems like that has never happened through both Republican and Democratic administrations. And I'm not holding my breath. (laughs) My name is Pat Morita, and I'm from Ohio, and I volunteer with the Sierra Club. I chair the Ohio Sierra Club's Nuclear Free Committee. So we've been working for a lot of years on issues in Ohio, and one of the spots that we work on is the Portsmouth nuclear site. And that's actually kind of a misnomer because the Portsmouth nuclear site is actually in Piketon, Ohio. And that's in southern Ohio. They had a gaseous diffusion uranium enrichment plant down there for many years. That started in the 50s and they enriched uranium for bombs. And unbelievably, they brought in high-level radioactive waste and ran it through the process buildings through the entire site Now, that site, those process buildings cover 93 acres, and at the time they were among the largest buildings in the world, 93 acres under roof. They brought in reprocessed high-level radioactive waste, which had technetium and the transuranics, including plutonium contaminating the entire site. So that got closed. That was closed in the early 2000s, and they started enriching, attempted to enrich uranium with a company called USEC, which had been the former United States Enrichment Corporation. At the Sierra Club, we were were working on that. We tried to intervene in that. Of course, the intervention was dismissed by the Department of Energy. We know about what has been happening with the the Zahn's Corner School, where uranium was found What has been happening since that discovery, and what is this latest information that you have to share with us? Two days ago, the Department of Energy announced that they are going to start enriching uranium again. They are giving a three-year contract to an entity calling itself Centris, which is actually the reorganized USEC, the failed Yes, the one that went bankrupt reorganized itself as Centris. Uh, We have not found out yet how much money they're going to give over this three-year period, but they have an enrichment process. We think it's going to be centrifuges. We doubt that it's going to really... Well, it's unproven. Let's let's say that. The technology is unproven. But uh, in the meantime, taxpayer money is going to this boondoggle. Actually, there are a number of problems with it. First of all, it's going to enrich uranium up to 20 percent, and that could be a crossover between civilian and military uses. And second of all, they're touting this as possible fuel for these new small modular reactors. Again, those small modular nuclear reactors are unproven technology. So there you go, public money into trying to keep the nuclear idea alive.
Note that this last interview with Pat Morida marks the first time that we spoke about issues in Ohio. To learn more about what she knows and what she reports on, you can listen to last week's Nuclear Hot Seat number 441 from December 3rd, 2019, where I interviewed Pat at length about nuclear problems faced in Ohio. This has been just a sampling of thoughts from a sampling of national activists working on nuclear waste issues in their home communities. If you didn't hear anyone from your local nuclear waste nightmare, don't assume that they weren't there, because they were. There is literally not a state in this union that does not have its own nuclear problems, and there are people working hard on all of the issues that they represent. But help is always needed. Minds, bodies hands, contributions. So if you find that you have been moved, concerned, perhaps alarmed by what you've heard here today, please go online to find a local nuclear group to join or contact Nuclear Hot Seat at info at nuclearhotseat.com and we will help you find one. The future you save may be your own or your kids or your grandkids or their great-great-great-great-grandkids. On the final day of our gathering, Monday, November 11, a small group of us took a toxic tour of Los Alamos, not the lab itself, which is restricted and requires a high security clearance in order to visit, but public lands surrounding it, as well as the town of Los Alamos. There's no time to report on this horrifying side trip on the show, but we will have it up, aiming for next week, here on Nuclear Hot Seat. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, December 10, 2019. Our thanks to the Albuquerque-based Nuclear Issues Studies Group and the tireless efforts of Leona Morgan and many, many others in order to bring this event off. And thanks to the Chicago-based Nuclear Energy Information Service, as well as all of the groups and individuals who contributed so much to making this recent conference such a profound success. A reminder to you that Nuclear Hot Seat is now available on all your favorite podcast platforms, so what are you waiting for? Sign up, subscribe, and don't miss a single episode. I want to thank all of you for listening because you are joining an international community of Nuclear Hot Seat listeners and followers, literally in 123 countries on six continents and counting. Now, if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. And if you appreciate weekly verifiable news updates about nuclear issues around the world, take a moment to send a donation of any size to NuclearHotSeat.com. We will be really grateful for your support. This episode of Nuclear Hot Seat is copyright 2019, Libby Halevi and Heartistry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. So as long as you mention the name of the show and the URL, go for it. Put it up on your site. Share it with others. Send it out. We need your help in getting this information out to the rest of the world. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that the last thing anyone fighting against nuclear ever wants to be able to say is, I told you so. Let's not go there. So, here you go. You've all had your nuclear wake-up call. Now don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.